with the Newburyport Literary Festival. This is our third virtual and 17th overall Newburyport Literary Festival. I'm Leslie Hendrickson. I'm on the steering committee. And thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure to introduce Samir Panda, who is the author of the novel Members Only, a finalist for the California Book Award and an NPR Best Book of 2020. His story collection, The Blind Writer, was long listed for the Penn Open Award. His cultural criticism has appeared in a range of publications, including The Atlantic, Salon, Sports Illustrated, and ESPN. He is the recipient of the Penn Civitella Fellowship and an Associate Professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Lauren Gronstein is the author of a short story collection, The Best of Animals, and four novels, including the Washington Post of the Book of the Year, The Explanation of Everything, and the New York Times bestseller, A Friend of the Family. Her new novel, We Must Not Think of Ourselves, will be published next spring, and she teaches creative writing, uh, teaches in the creative writing MFA program at Rutgers Camden, where she is a professor of English. She lives with her family in New Jersey. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for being here, and then, Lauren, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I am so happy, Samir, to have a chance to talk to you. I love this book. It was such a pleasure to read. And also because there was a certain amount of domestic chaos in this book, I assume that you will uh, forgive me if some of my own domestic chaos uh, joins us in the Zoom. I live with a few big dogs, large and small children, etc. cetera. Um, so, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I, um, I'm gonna just dive right in and talk about this really, really interesting multi-dimensional um, page turner of a novel that you wrote called Members Only. Um, in the back of the book, there was some Q&A stuff, which I used as a bit of a cheat, cheat to get started and thinking about what yeah. I was gonna talk to you about. And, um, and also there was some writing from you and, and, and it seems that this book contains some of your own experiences, although you hesitate to use the word autofiction, which is good because I'm not entirely sure what autofiction is. But um, I wanted to know how you wrestled with bringing yourself into this novel and, and you know, how, what were the complications of doing that? Yeah, first of all, thank you. Thank you. I'm so uh, excited to be here. And I think we were talking earlier, it would have been really fun to do this in person, mm -hmm. but this next is year. Next, this, year. next year, next year, the sunny next year. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I think this is a, um, a, a, a question I have wrestled with, right? Which is that there's a way in which I, I, I think one of the ways I can answer this question about kind of autobiography is, or, or kind of how I brought myself into this is in a certain way, to talk about race and I'll explain why, right? Which is, I think there was a way in which I was really hesitant for the early part of my writing life to write directly on the topic, right? That it felt too on the nose. And in a way, my first book was trying to, trying to do this thing where I was saying like, well, maybe I can actually, if I get to the details of all of this, then I don't have to talk about this, you know, the specifics of it, right? Now, 2016 happened, right? And this novel, which I had been kind of dancing around suddenly became the thing I needed to write immediately, right? And so I think in a way to your question, if I wanted to write directly about race, I kind of just had to write directly about myself, right? Like that there was the particular race question that this book is trying to explore, right? Which is what does brownness look like? What happens when you have kind of, when you're in this kind of space in between blackness and whiteness, right? And it is necessarily a shifting space. And the only way I could get to that shift space, right? Precisely because it is so shifting. And of course, race as a category by its very nature is shifting. As much as our public discourse wants to say it's really calcified, it is incredibly fluid, right? And so I think that um, in order for me to honestly get to that space, I had to just be like, what's the thing been like for me for the last 40 years I've lived in this country, right? Yeah. And, you know, the, the line that I give you know, Lauren, which I'm kind of sick of hearing from myself, which is all the good parts are of Raj Butt is autobiography, all the shitty parts are complete fiction, right? 
But look, it is, you know, like a lot of my own biography reads on Raj Butt. But, you know, if I were to be completely honest, you know, fiction writing is, if, if I could, I would have written this as a memoir, I think, if I wanted to be so close to my own experiences, right? Like, the novel is a different genre. It allows the wiggle room when you most need the wiggle room. Yeah, yeah, that's really nicely put. And just so that the audience knows, and this is not a spoiler, it happens right in the very beginning of the novel. Um, Raj, our protagonist, is uh, a member of a tennis club and he tries in what felt to me like a very sympathetic gesture. You know, it was obviously um, the, the kind of thing you don't say in play company, but he he makes a kind of, in trying to identify with a mem with a, a potential member of the club who happens to be African-American in a club that is otherwise entirely white, he tries to drop in a little bit of urban slang um, and does a riff on the N-word and, and, and sort of plaintively says later, do I have to explain the difference between N-I-G-G-A and, you know, the other spelling of it. And he, you know, he really wants to sort of excuse himself for what he sees and what the reader can almost understand is a, a sort of righteous attempt at connection. But of course mm -hmm. it fails miserably. The audience is not the right audience for this. Uh, the, I mean, the audience of, of white people in the room is not the right audience. The, the person who's applying to this club is just flabbergasted. And Raj himself, who often seems to put his foot in his mouth, um, which of course is the part of him that does not, <laughs> you, right? Of course. Uh, the, you know, he's, he's left sort of flabbergasted because yes, this was a clumsy move, but at the same time, he's been sort of subjected to other people's racial clumsiness half his life. And yet here he is being castigated you know, when, when no one has ever thought to defend him. And I felt that that was really sympathetic. Um, and I'm wondering where that, that kernel of the novel came from. And I hope you forgive me for just sort of like encapsulating. No, 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 no. It, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, right? So it, it is, I, I think a, a part of that moment, right? Which is, I think that that's, you'd refer to it as a, as a sympathetic moment, right? And I think that that is this, I, I worked on that first chapter, I think, more than I have worked on any other piece of fiction I've ever created, right? Is because if I didn't get that first chapter right, the, 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 the audience of the book and the audience of the readers were not going to go along on the journey with me. Right. And I think that there is a way in which what I was trying to work through was this idea that what would it mean if a gesture is interpreted radically differently by the people that are involved in the moment? Right. That in a way, I think you can see that there are three different reactions to the gesture, right? From Raj Bhatt himself who feels completely horrified because he didn't think he was actually going to say it. He was just mouthing it to himself, which is, you know, uh, you know what many of us do, right? Which is like, okay, is this going to sound? I mean, of course he had no intention of doing it. Uh, there is Bill and Valerie Brown, who are the African-American couple that are the kind of in the profoundly awkward position of figuring out whether to be angry or not, right? And kind of the decisions they are going to have to make there. And then there are the five, the four other committee members that are in that group, right? And so I think to your question, how I came about this is, I think a part of what I wanted to think about with this novel was how is it that one specific moment can be read so profoundly differently by the same group of people sitting in the same room, listening to the same intonations that Raj Bhatt is using, right? So there's, there's no hearsay. Everyone is in that room, right? And um, you know, one of the interesting thoughts I had as I was writing this book was that it would be a very different book in the third person, right? In the sense that going with Bill and Valerie Brown as they drive away from the club, right? Novelistically, it would have been a very different bag of beans if I'm oh, like yeah. in the, if I'm in the car with them, right? And I think in a way- very interesting. Very, to hear that very, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think I, I stick with Raj. It's a very- heavily first person novel, right? I stick with Rogers because part of what I want 
Raj to be doing, and this is going back to that brownness question that I began with, is that he becomes a conduit for all of these conversations, right? That that is a part of what, that he is having to, you know, because one of the arguments that I could make, right? Or I, one of the things that I was thinking about that moment is, and I think this is a phrase that gets now overused, is how much code switching both Raj and Bill are doing in that moment. Yeah. Right. It's because, of course, when Bill says, I played a little at Stanford, he is code switching to his white audience, right, mm -hmm. who see his blackness and presumably assume a certain kind of athleticism in his blackness. And so in order to diffuse that, Bill is saying, yeah, I did a little of this. Right. He's clearly humble bragging. Right. Raj, but who recognizes that wants to deeply con connect with him because First and middle and last, when he sees Bill Brown, he feels a profound amount of envy from how well his pink shirt looks to how well educated he is to how you know easy he is with his kind of leisure and athleticism, right? And so he does a bit of code switching. And so I think to your question about like the, the kernel of it, that moment of Raj saying something like that had arrived as the first thing for this novel, right? Like in a way, and I'm not giving anything away, there's a moment with, um, there's a moment with uh, a kind of Ganesh at the end of the novel that uh, was the ending point that I wanted to end up with, right? And I think I kind of played around with those things. But anyway, to say all of that, that that is kind of where, that, that early moment was kind of set figuring out what to do with that early moment was the challenge of figuring out how to write this book. Yeah, I mean, it's such a dangerous, dangerous thing to play with, you know, that the word is, is, um, you know, I'll say anything. I will, if I'm in traffic, I'll curse in front of my child, but I am not mm -hmm. going to ever say that word. It's, it's such a, it's TNT, right? And I yep. really um, admired the, not just that, not, I admired Raj for, for thinking it through and not just, you know, throwing his hands up that he really tried to understand his own reason. You know, he had a deep, there were a deep well of reasons why he said this thing. And it did stem from his obvious sense of insecurity, his desperate, pathetic, attempt, not to, you know, pathetic mm -hmm. attempt. No, all good. Connect. Yeah. And, and that, you know, as someone, as all of us, I think, n n have seen ourselves as outsiders. N all of, I don't know anyone who hasn't at some point in his or her life felt that need to impress someone, to be like someone. And, and that felt very human to me and, and really definitely handled, even though it was also such a shocking and toxic thing to come out yeah. of his mouth. Later in the book, um, Raj, uh, student, so Raj is a, a teacher and he occupies a sort of precarious place in university life. He's a lecturer, which means mm -hmm. he's not gonna get tenure he'll never get tenure. And, and that means that he can be fired at any time. And that sense of precarity, you know, is, is evident in his life in all sorts of ways. At this, the same terrible week during which Raj says this very ill-advised thing to the Browns, he also uh, manages to piss off some students um, who lash out at him as being anti-Christian. And I was yeah. curious about that. If that, if, if, you know, that had any, you yourself were a professor, um, did that idea come from anywhere in particular? Were you thinking more about general campus climate right now? Where did, where did you get the inspiration for that? Yeah, so look, I love campus novels, right? I love, you know, when I was writing this book, the tagline I had for it was Brown Straight Man. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, so Straight Man, if you guys don't know, and I hope you do, Straight Man is, is I think, and I love Lucky Jim, and I love, I love human, the human stain, which your book sort of speaks to a little bit. But yeah. Of all campus novels, Straight Man by Richard Russo is the best one. I've written yep. one, Straight Man's much better. Like, read that book, go on. I mean, I love Straight Man, right? And you, and of course, you know this as well as I do. You and I could just make the list, right? Yep. Start with Lucky Jim, go through yep. Stoner, yep. go through oh, Michael Stoner, Chabon. Wonderful. Yep, yep, yep. Right, yep. But, but here's the thing in all of them, it's always a tenured white dude in crisis. Correct. Right, it, that is always it, right? Even even as, you know, my favorite line from Straight Man is like getting tenure at Altoona State was like winning a shit eating contest, right? <laughs> even as, even as the tenure 
at Altoona State is such, for him, not some great moment of arrival. I think the central mode of particularly the American campus novel is that there is a, usually, a lot of times a creative writing professor who has arrived after tenure has lost his creativity and lo and behold, a 20 year old young woman comes out from exit right, right? That, right. Is, the, that is the genre, right? right. I have a been, bad one. You can do a lot with it. <laughs> you can do it. And, and obviously people have done a lot with it, right? But here's the thing. The campus has radically changed. Yes. That a large percentage of American campuses do not in fact have tenured faculty members, have lectures, which is a job that I did for a decade when I left one tenure track job, had a crisis of faith about being a literary critic. I quit the job, said I want to become a fiction writer. You and quit spent your tenure track job? I yeah, I, 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 a lovely job I had at Queens College in the CUNY system, mm -hmm. and I, I totally had a crisis, and I just thought, I can't do this. Anyway, it, I can say this all with a funny joke now, because it worked out, because right. I, got, I got tenure elsewhere, right. and I, I kind of got back on the tenure track, right? But there was basically a 10 to 12 year period when I was teaching eight classes a year with not great pay. Um, and with two young kids, right? Yeah. And that's the campus novel I wanted to read, right? In a sense that I wanted to kind of figure out what, so on one hand, I wanted to rethink what that was doing. Number two, what I wanted was to wonder if an arrival at a certain kind of racial consciousness can work as a midlife crisis, right? So that Raj's midlife crisis is to be like, oh my God, I have tried to pass for a good number of years. And this is the human stain part of this, right? Which is a novel that I love, right? Which is about kind of what happens when you've basically passed for this whole time and then get caught, right? And how your, un how your life unravels, right? So those are the couple of genre things that I was trying to redo, excuse me, redo with this book. But Lauren, as you know, as well as me, the campus is changing. It has changed. Students are saying, saying things directly to you that they would not have said in the past, right? I used to kind of like, like get my body ready to go into office hours to ask my one question and one out of there, right? That is not the affect that exists anymore. It's a very different kind of affect. Yeah. And so what I tried to do in this book was to get a sense of, right, like what happens if he is called a racist by the liberals at the tennis club and called the same thing by conservatives at school, right? Because part of the idea there is, and the title of the book is playing with this, is that he has membership at the tennis club, but where he's primarily does not have membership is into the club he really wants to get into, which is the university, right? And the university operates on membership deeply, right? Because we know when we walk around campus who are the club members, right? And we know who are not, and the, those who are not look really exhausted because they are, you know, teaching upwards of 1,000, 1,500 students a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a brutal system um, that, and it's exploitive, and yet also, um, I don't know any way out of it, really. I, it's hard to imagine um, how the problem of precarious academic labor is going to be solved. But in your novel, the, the real conflict is not between Raj and his chair, who is actually seems really supportive. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's not an administration versus non-tenure track labor novel. It's a novel where the students um, start following Raj around, going on hunger strike to protest the fact that, and I, I, I can't remember the exact line, but it's that, that there's a, the emptiness of Christian culture or something that he, he yeah. he's offhandedly I, mentions that. I, I mean, I make a joke of this, but you know, it is, he makes a joke, he makes, he does a lecture using Said's notion of Orientalism, right? By the time this book is, it's vaguely set in the fall of 2016, right? Said's Orientalism is now a 30 year old book, right? There's nothing radical left about the book, right? It's just saying, this is kind of Orientalist discourse. This is the ways in which the West has talked about the East, right? Like, and so it is the most kind of milk toast argument possible, right? And I think usually controversy always begins with really 
random offhand stuff, right? Yeah. He just says, he doesn't even say Christianity is empty. He says that Americans in the early 20th century were so invested in, you know, the Deepak Chopras of their time because it filled the emptiness that Christianity left behind, right? Like, it's not some, so I, I think the point being that you can, the, the, the point that, and he even says, Raj even says to his chair, it's like, dude, I've been, this is like a bread and butter kind of lecture I've been giving for a decade and no one's bothered me with it, right? And so I think it's also a shift in time when an idea that you think is fairly kind of straightforward is no longer straightforward. You know? Right, because it's not just that, that the student's attitude towards their professors has changed. I think it's also that the political climate has changed and that, that you know, um, people have hunkered down into their sides. People are looking to be aggrieved often, not just students, all of us, right? We all yep. live in this world. And we're, we're ready, I think, to um, make very, very broad, I don't know, assumptions about other people even when we know very little based on the sort of political tribalism. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, part of that culture as well. It's not just, certainly not just students, but it was interesting to me that uh, uh, an idea that was pretty anodyne, right? That, you know, that this is why Westerners are attracted to Eastern culture, led yeah. to, you know, led to hunger strikes. And yet when I was reading that, I thought, oh, as soon as I read that slide, I was like, oh no, because I just yeah. know what you can't, what, what feels dangerous to talk about now. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things I actually point out in the book is that Raj also is angry from the night before, right? So he is also, he's pushing the slide as well, right? Like I think he is at a particular moment of frustration where he's just like, yeah, I've been making this argument, but I'm gonna make it with a certain amount of added gusto, right? Yeah. And, and I think that that is, I, I think the one thing I wanted to, I, I was not going to embrace Raj Bhatt, right? Like my job in this book was to both embrace him and, you know, keep poking holes at him, right? It's because he, he is full of his own faults, right? And I think that that is uh, kind of in the process of writing this, working through those faults is really interesting. Um, the one thing I wanted to kind of add to what you're saying, right, about, I mean, that's what becomes the nature of culture wars, right? You don't need much to yeah. pick your sides. You can just be like, yo, this is, I'm gonna do this. And this is like, you, you, it's like, we seem to fight over things that we don't need to be fighting over. Oh right? gosh. And, and so like- Massive uproar in my town right now because a, a school document went around without genders in it, you know, referring to people, I don't even know, they just used the phrase business people instead of businessman or something like yeah. that. And that was enough to spark just, you know, 20 minutes of out, internet outrage, the likes of which you'd think that we were talking about something that mattered. Yeah. No, and, 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 and it is like having kids in, in school right now is, is, school's a complicated place right now, right? And it is like, you know, what my teenager comes home with in terms of what he is saying in relationship to what his friends think, what he thinks, right? it's like, you know, they're, they've been inside for two years and now they're like, like the rest of us, right? And I think that that's in some ways, you know, what, you know, there's a whole section of this novel about Raj Bhatt returning to India uh, to do dissertation research, right? And he, he goes to Gujarat, which is the state where I was born, uh, to the town of Ahmedabad where I was born, right? And I, I lived in Bombay until I was eight and then we moved to America. Um, in 2002, you know, there's this massive communal violence in Gujarat between the Hindus and the Muslims. And part of the reason why I was trying to create a parallel was to think about, you know, Ahmedabad is one of these towns where, you know, the unofficial motto is we all get along so well, right? It isn't, of course, but it, this is this narrative that certain cities have about themselves, right? In the way that, you know, New York City talks about itself as being so resilient, right? Like, I think that we, we, all, we all need narratives to kind of, to, to shape kind of where we live and why we live there, right? And so there's this massive violence that occurred. And I think that what I was trying to think of is what happens when there is communal violence in a place that is so deeply based on 
its identity being anti-communal, right? Mm. We, we, we think, you know, I, I, there are so many cliches for this. We think things are not going to happen here. And I think inevitably part of what I was trying to work through with this novel, and I think what you were saying is like, these are random little occurrences, right? The two gaffes that Raj Butt makes are not really in the realm, of, in, in the kind of larger realm of things are not stupidly crazy, right? But things of course kind of um, break apart precisely from those little things. And I think that's well, what- And it's amplified by, see, this is what I was talking about. Love it. There we Love go. It. Um, it was amplified by where Raj is in his life, which I also found very sympathetic, right? He's in his forties, his kids, one of his kids seems to have a little bit of social issue, you know, is having some social little, issues. Little, little, little hyperactivity. Stuff, right? Well, it, um, he is feeling the, you know, there's constant financial pressure. You know, he's he's really living in a, a world that is um, putting, it's, it's, there's a lot of pressure on him right now, right? Yep. So, so mm -hmm. that pressure, I think, and in any good novel, what you really want to do, I think, is take the pressure and just keep turning it, turning it, turning it. Yep. So um, there it goes. There's, I have, this is not a bear. This is just a big dog. Oh my Lord. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I was wondering just how you felt about all these different pressures on his life. Not, so that this is not just a novel about a guy who says something dumb. This is a guy who says something dumb at a really tough moment mm -hmm. in terms, not just of his country, but of his own biography. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A couple of things. Thank you for that. I mean, there are a couple of things is I think the one thing I was really actually interested in was fatherhood, right? And I think I have realized that one of, when people ask me, like, you know, when random people ask me, it's like, hey, you know, I, I was, for the first time in my life, a week ago, I got acupuncture because my back went out, oh. right? And I was like, dude, acupuncture, this thing is amazing. Of course, I came out afterwards. I, I, I felt like I was like seeing double, right? Yeah. And 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 I, the guy is great. He's working on me. He's got needles in me. And he's like, so what do you write about? And I said, uh, sad middle-aged men, right? And I love sad middle-aged men, right? Yeah. And because the, the, I'm trying to think through, I don't know, their, their, their graces and their their failures. And so on one hand, part of what I was trying to do here was to think about kind of what contemporary fatherhood looks like amongst the men that I know, mm -hmm. right? In a way, the men that, you know, are in certain domestic relationships where both couples are working, where, you know, and in this way, it's, a, a, a deeply kind of middle, upper middle class novel, right? Because that is the cultural space that I am most interested in. Um, so that's one of the things that the book was trying to do. The second thing is, you know, the immigrant novel necessitates a movement from kind of some kind of abjectness into the arrival into America, right? And I think a part of the, the, the offense that Raj takes when he joins this tennis club is when someone comes up to him and says, you know, I never went to places like this when I was growing up. And Raj in his mind thinks, why do you assume I didn't grow up in a place like this when I was growing up? Right. Which is in fact, he did, right? right? And I think that what is, I am interested in with Raj Butt is what happens when you, grow up in a certain upper middle class immigrant space or upper middle class kind of space where you came from. And then the act of immigration basically means a kind of a demotion on the social hierarchy sure. in terms of class and in terms of race, right? Sure. And so I think a part of what Raj is dealing with in middle age is immigration made certain amounts of promises, right? We need those promises, which is, it'll all be good. Your lives will improve. You learn the language and you will be fine, right? And so I think a part of what I'm trying to think through with his failures, right? And this is in some ways a book about failures, right? Which is that part of the reason why the failure feels so acute is that I think 
in his mind, in the narrative that has been created in his mind, the idea was that he'd arrive at this ideal place. And he doesn't, in fact, arrive at that ideal place. And so I think in that way, a more general riff on fatherhood and a more specific riff on a particular kind of second generation immigrant fatherhood, right? The, you know, uh, I think there's a fairly well-founded cliche that most of these Indian American men are doing well in tech, right? And I think there is a whole different aspect of this population that I was trying to kind of work through here. And he, and Raj is such a different parent father than his own father was, you know? I, 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 absolutely, you know, and I, I don't, yeah, and I, I do, uh, yes, absolutely. And he's trying to figure that out, right? What does it mean to be a different kind of father? Yeah. I loved his father. His father was a very careful guy who later in life sent out uh, investment tips in a newsletter. And I just loved that. I love that. I love that way of connecting. I think so many fathers, not just Indian fathers, but, and this might be an unfair generalization, but, but, you know, looked for ways to connect with their kids that were perhaps a bit unorthodox, leaving the sort of nurturing domestics space to the moms and so what's left well a lot of practical advice and Raj's dad did that practical part of parenting so beautifully in these newsletters telling his kids well this is how you're going to make some money and this is how you're going to save some money and this is what you should look for in a company and I just I found that I, I know it wasn't well I don't think it was supposed to be as moving as it was but I found it really moving that idea. yeah no 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 I mean I think that's a thing right which is uh it, it is there is, I was trying to get at this generation of these men who immigrated to this country, right, where, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about this, which is, you know, my generation, right, a lot of us in many ways have become writers to manage our emotional kind of universe, right, that that generation was very different, right, like these are, you know, my, my, my father arrived here and this is where some of this stuff, the, the dad in the book is very much my father. My dad arrived here at the age of 47 with three children, mm -hmm. right? And started over, right? Literally began from scratch, right? And, you know, uh, so I was trying to kind of figure all that stuff out, right? Like, you know, uh, I turned 47 a couple of years ago and I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I could restart this thing in yeah. a new country with three kids, right? And so I think I was trying to kind of figure all of that out, right? And there's a a a, a, a riff, you know, you know, Raj kind of has this thing about Springsteen, right? And kind of what it means to like Springsteen if Springsteen, and I think Hilton Alls had this kind of really terrific riff on Springsteen, which is like, I don't know if to like him or not, you know, in the way in, in how he, um, whether he speaks to me or not, right? And I think Springsteen has this kind of riff about dads being ghosts versus ancestors. And they are, they are ghostly when they're not present. They're ancestors when they're trying to give you something useful, right? Yeah. And to kind of pass something down. And I think that's exactly the point, which is the financial advice is, look, I know how to do this. Let me give you this gift. I may not be able to give you the gifts of like hugging you, but I will give you something different. And that something different is really help set Raj up, right? They bought their house in a very expensive yeah. place because, you know, dad helped him out. No, no, totally. And that's a, and that's, I, and I, I wanted to be completely honest about that kind of stuff, right? Oh, Which is, yeah, it live, I was in California recently. I was in, you know, New Jersey is not a low cost state, but in California, the real estate, the, the you know, it's, it's a hard place, I think. And for people who in other places, a lecturer and a nonprofit exec would be okay. But I, you know, the, this family feels sort of financially nervous all the time, I think, right? Oh, totally, yeah. And I, and, I, and I cannot underscore how precarious university, university lecturing is, right? Despite in my case, you know, the UC system is very good about the contracts and stuff like that. And so when I talk about precarity, I mean, of course, on one level, just the, the, the actual, will I lose my job or not? But I actually think much more is the emotional precarity, right? Which is like, what, what am I doing 
here, right? Like, how is it, like, do, do I see myself here for my whole career where I am in essence, kind of by the very nature of this system, invisible labor? Yeah. What is your relationship to the university like? Do you feel you're at UC Santa Barbara, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for me, I mean, I, I, I feel really fortunate that I, you know, my, my department had a, a job opening. I applied to it. A lot of people applied to it as well. And I ended up with the job and, you know, and much later than all the friends that I went to graduate school with got tenure. I got tenure last year, yeah. right? And so I feel a very different relationship to the institution now, right? Uh, and, you know, I, I, it struck me at a certain point that I went to college at the age of 18. I took one year off between my bachelor's and my PhD. That means I've spent my entire adult life on a college campus. Right. I mean, it's insane. Right. And I think I, I do that because I like it. I like it as a cultural space. Yeah. I like, I, you know, I, I, I like, I, I can see, we, we were talking about this, I can see the generational differences in front of me. Right. And all of that stuff is, you know, if it didn't work, then, you know, you'd find something different. Um, but I, I think uh, I am kind of, really interested in what happens here because I think what happens here is a pretty decent indicator of what might happen more broadly in the years to come. Sure and it's such an interesting place because you measure yourself every year you know everything is cyclical you start out you know you're a student graduate student then you're about this you know you're a little bit older than your students your students yeah. stay the same age you keep getting older the things that you, the generational markers keep getting different. And this yeah. is something that traps up Raj, right? That he was yeah. once upon a time, he understood his students better, but there's now a great, there's a gap between his experience and theirs. Yeah. And one of the students, Robert follows him around and says, I just want what you have. And Raj is like, you want what I have? What do I have? But I think for so many young people, the, even the, the sort of basic beyond just the work hard and make a lot of money thing, just the very basic, like find a nice woman who will marry you, have a house and a dog, that shit seems almost uh, imaginary. Like, how does that even happen? Yeah. For Raj, it's sort of a given that like, okay, like I might not get tenure, but I, you know, this, this, the, the sort of basic elements of my life are achievable. But for one of his students, it seems like a, a fairy tale. And I thought that that spoke a little bit to the gap between, people who are 18, 19, 20, their expectations of the future versus Raj's expectations. There was just an article in the Times, which is like a gross way to start any sentence, and I apologize, but like there was just an article in the Times about unionization in Starbucks and Amazon and why it's happening. Well, it's happening because a lot of people who went to college are finding, aren't finding the kinds of jobs they used to find and instead are working in Starbucks or working in Amazon warehouses. And but they have college educations and they know about unionization and they have the kind of, um, I guess, uh, confidence that might come with a bachelor's degree to say, hey, let's start a union. That's really interesting, right? That says, mm -hmm. well, the very basic expectation, like I go to college and then I get a job that pays a salary and not just an hourly wage, that's fraying. Robert knows that. Raj, I don't think does, right? No. And, and I think that that's, I mean, it is in a way, I feel great sympathy for Robert, even as he is terrorizing Raj, yeah. right? In the sense that I felt a, in the same way that Raj feels this great sense of kind of empathy for this young man, Babu, that he meets in India, right? Who is like, how much of he, how much will he participate or how much did he participate in the violence that occurred in Gujarat, right? And I think I'm trying to create a parallel between that 19 year old and Robert, the 19 year old, right? It's because I do think that there is a way in which whatever you want, however you want to label Robert, right? Like as, a, uh, as an incel, as whatever it is, right? There's something going on there, right? Like he sees no sense of his future, right? And he, he is grasping at kind of, what he he's following Raj around and you know he shows up at the club and he's like what is all this 
this. Like, I want this. Yeah. Like, there's your wife and your children and this lovely place. There's mm-hmm. nothing, there, there's no grass growing through the tennis courts. Mm-hmm. I'm all in on all this, right? Because he doesn't know. I, I don't think he can see a way forward. And right. I think that that is, I think, I mean, in our this conversation, Stations about culture wars and stuff. That's what we are struck with right now, right? Which is like I, I think, and, and you know, I, I, I'm really careful to not be like, oh, you know, I was thinking through this, but there is a way in which, kind of, one could maybe draw a line between Robert and the January sixth folks, right? Like this to to not suggest that I'm being empathetic to, kind of. January 6th folks right but there is this this rage that Robert is feeling right and 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 it's such a it's such a kind of ridiculous ridiculous rage right and it is a rage kind of based on certain notions of white supremacy that are really troubling right and I think Robert doesn't articulate it that way but there are clearly rumblings of it there yeah sure yeah Right. I mean, it's this really strange stew that Robert lives in. And that, yeah, yeah, it's a great way of putting it. Um, the one other thing I was going to say about the, the thing about the changes in generation is, you know, I am really well aware that my time to be making random like Kanye West references in class are ending, right? Like, I will look like the You idiot. look weird. It, it's not cool, man. It's not cool. It's just, I mean, honestly, I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I can't deal with Kanye West anyway, but right. now even his younger, more interesting version, I'm just going to look like a jackass for doing it, right? Which, it, it was so helpful 10 First years ago. First, looking like a jackass, you look like you're pandering, and that is just <laughs> kiss of death. Right. Yeah. No, and they know it instantly. They know it instantly, you know, that there is, like, you know, there's a great, there's a great SNL skit when, you know, uh, anyway, somebody comes That's in. And while Miranda comes in and says, like, exactly. I when I when when I when I saw that, I'm like, okay, it's time to be done. Yep. It's time to it's time to stick to my Joseph Conrad references, you know. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I uh, I made I had the misfortune. My my kid trades sneakers, and he bought me a very gorgeous pair of Jordans, uh, and I wore them to class, and the whole class was just like, come on like let's not pretend i was like right sorry sorry guys uh, no that is so funny it, it, literally i am when we're done with this my kids are shopping for jordans right now oh, yeah. and i and, and i'm just like you know there's a part of me and this is completely off topic where i was just like no i'm not gonna let them do this this is you know, nike's just gonna get all this money and i'm like let them buy the shoes. Let them enjoy wearing the shoes. Okay. I'm just not. I'm just not going to wear them. You know. Let let them in, enjoy this process. Like the years I had, like I wore knockoffs from Kmart. Like I don't need to repeat that stuff for my for my okay. children. Like there's no reason to. I know. I know. It's not. It's not. It's not really more pure to make your kids miserable, right? It no, just- really. Honestly, they, it's it, 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 it's not good for anyone involved. Yeah. In that, you know. Yeah. Except maybe your bank account, but um, so tell me, so do you play tennis? I, I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I played a ton. I played in high school and then uh, I stopped basically for my 20s when I was in graduate school because I thought I needed the time to read Marx. And that was just stupid because if I just continued playing tennis, I would have been healthy during graduate school <laughs> as opposed to like miserable. Uh, and then I didn't when we lived in New York for five years because it's really hard to find courts. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we moved back to California, I, I started playing it again. And, you know, aesthetically, I love the sport. It is- That was my next question. Tell me what you like about tennis. Um, when you look at a tennis court, like when you literally look at a tennis court, I'm like, this is just a rectangle. That's all it is with a bunch of lines. Yeah. And you, you can have, so much variation there, right? You can be terrible at it and you can be Nadal at it, right? It's the same exact thing. It's the same angles. It's the same space. It's the same rackets. You can go buy the rackets that these guys use and these women use, right? So on one hand, aesthetically, it is one of the things that I enjoy. As I said, I grew up playing, I grew up in Bombay playing cricket. And I'm wondering if, Part of 
what this is, is just my kind of colonial aftermath, right? Which okay. is that I, I kind of, tennis and cricket are these like deeply col colonial sports, right? And there is a way in which um, very early on, I wonder if I was imprinted with this idea of kind of what sporting was to look like, right? Mm -hmm. It also is a happenstance that we moved somewhere when we arrived in this country where there's a tennis court. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just started kind of tooling around. And, you know, so I, I don't know why we end up in the sports that we end up in, right? And uh, it, and it is interesting to, to have kind of ended up here. Uh, and then the professional sport is, of course, really amazing, right? To kind of watch, you know, if when, you know, when you watch Serena for the first time or when you watch Federer for the first time, you're like, oh, this is weird. Like these people do things that people, that we just can't do, right? You ever heard and, David Foster Wallace on tennis? Yeah, he is. And he was actually a really good tennis player. He was a yeah. good tennis player. And he wrote about how the distance between him being, I think, a nationally ranked. I think he was a, I think he was an Illinois state champion. I think right. he was a really good tennis player. Yeah. And the distance between his tennis and the tennis of, I think he said like Pete Sampras or something at the time, or Andre Agassi. And, and just the, 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 you know, it's like comparing a kitten to a cheetah, even at that level. That, totally. That, what the best tennis players can do is almost unbelievable. Yeah, uh, no, and, and I, I, and I, I, I went at UCSB, they have a very good tennis team. I took my kids to go watch them and they're just hitting the, 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 the stripes off the ball. And what's yeah. really crazy for how good they are, they don't have a future in the professional mm -hmm. game, right? And I, no shade on all those amazing mm -hmm. players, right? Maybe they'll, yeah. they'll break through. But they don't because it's just in, in terms of if you're a, a, a young man, if, if, if you've not kind of gotten there by the time you're 15, 16, it's done, right? And it's the same with the, with the women as well, right? And that's per, part of the reason why, you know, it's Emma like, Raducanu, and they're so young. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Kids, no, but it's like being born, you know, with someone sprinkles fairy dust over you and you have that talent. Yeah. Like just, it's not, you know. I think all of the hard work in the world doesn't get you there unless you also have that fairy dust. And it's just really unusual. Um, yeah. You know, I worked really hard at soccer. I played, I trained, but I was, I was fine. <laughs> you know, And I never yeah. got better than fine because I just think that there are times when you're just, you know, and that's that, but it, that doesn't, shouldn't take away from the pleasure of it. Raj gets a lot of pleasure out of tennis and you could feel the pleasure was palpable. It was great. No, no, that's the thing is tennis yeah. is a great mid middle-aged sport, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not sure, you know, uh, I remember, do you remember that great scene in, uh, I think it's a, a movie version of Little Children that, uh, and, you know, they're all, these middle-aged men are playing football, right? And it's just like, that's not a great middle-aged sport to be playing like yeah. tackle football. Yeah. You know, that's, no. that's no good. That's no good for anybody, right? But tennis, it's okay. You know, you can still mess up your back. And it can still hurt, but you know, it's, you, you can keep doing it. And so, um, and mediocrity is something you should, one should totally embrace, right? It's, it's really undervalued to be solidly mediocre at sports. Or solidly and mediocre at anything. I am totally. solidly mediocre at all sorts of stuff, but I still like it. Um, no, also, totally. Leslie pointed out in the chat that it is Roger Federer. That was, that was who, uh, um, Dave Foster Wallace was writing about, and she linked to an article about that Wallace wrote um, that I encourage you. If you guys haven't read uh, David Foster Wallace on anything from cruises to eating lobster, I highly, highly recommend that as well. Um, we have time, I think, for one more longish question, which is one that I often find people in panel, you know, people, audiences want to know about, which was your path to publication. I'd love to know a little bit about getting this novel published, if you got any pushback, uh, because it, I don't know, about sort of the, the inciting incident at the beginning of the novel, yeah. um, and anything else about how this book, book got from your head to bookstores. Yeah, so I, I had, and I've written a little bit about this, I had been writing a very different kind of book. Um, I'd been writing a book about that I felt like I needed to write to become a serious writer. I'd been writing it, rewriting it, and like banging my head against a wall. In the summer of 2017, I'd gotten this remarkable fellowship to go to Italy for six months, six weeks, not six I was going to say six months. My, 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 my partner wife would have been like, ah, six months is 
a yeah. little, we had, you know, youngish kids. I needed time to work. I arrived there with the intention of writing a very different book. And I wrote the first draft of this book there in six weeks. Mm-hmm. Now, when I say first draft, it's a raging mess. Sure. But I needed, I needed to get the narrative structure down. So I did that in the fall of 20, um, uh, on the fall of 20, in, sorry, in the summer of 2017. And then um, when I got back to the States, you know, I, I have four or five readers that I trust and who are wonderful. And so I continued to work on it and then I, I, I gave it to them and, um, and they had all sorts of ideas. And then basically in the summer of 2018, I, uh, I, I, I found a new agent, um, Seth Fishman, who is wonderful. And Seth read it, read it very quickly. Seth does things quickly, which I really appreciate. And, uh, you know, he, he, he said something great to me. He said, you know, I think it's ready to go. We can either send this out immediately, or I think maybe we should wait till January because I want to send this out in the fall when, um, you know, when a lot of people are kind of sending books out on sub, right? And because he'll be a debut novelist. And I said, okay, let's just kind of do this early uh, or as quickly as we can. Um, and it found a very, very welcome home at Houghton Mifflin, which is now, I think, part of HarperCollins. And, um, but I it found a home with really a wonderful editor, uh, Naomi Gibbs, who, you know, who bought the book and, um, and, and I'm very particularly thankful for her is because she was leaving to get married. And right before she was leaving to get married, she, she, uh, she went through the process of purchasing the book. So I'm very glad she did that. And so we basically, uh, we edited it, you know, over the next year or so, you know, we, I think we, we must've gone through three full drafts and it was its original publication date was May 4th, 2020. If we can all now recall, it is the first wave of the coronavirus. And so uh, it was moved to July 7th, 2020. So it was, um, can I just say, it was a complicated time to publish a, a debut novel. Yeah. And, and, and yet it turned out to be perfectly fine. And mm-hmm. It, it was a great process. I, I had a great kind of experience with the editing of the book, of the marketing of the book. And, uh, you know, would I have preferred to have gone on tour like we had planned so I could meet all my friends and have great meals? Absolutely. But, you know, other things happened. The world had different ideas about what early 2020 was going to look like. And so, or mid 2020 was going to look like. So what are you working on now? You know, I am working on, and I'd, Lauren, I'd love you to give me the magic dust to help me write the next one more quickly. But it's not nearly as fast and quick as I thought it would be because I think, and I'm wondering if this is your experience, you're just climbing a very different hill. Right? Oh, sure. sure. The first novel, nobody's expecting it, you know? So you, yeah. just, you write it because you, you have an idea and you want to see where it goes. And then and then this wonderful thing happens, you get published, and then suddenly, you know, there are a few readers out there, there's an editor, there's an agent, there are people who might, you know, care. <laughs> and, yeah. and, that, and when those people live in your head, I find it a very different thing to, uh, to sit down and write. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's complicated. So I've been, you know, it, it is, I, I it, it, it's been, in, I, I, I think, restarting a new novel during the pandemic is complicated you know you're not with people there are lots of people at home and you know the 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 ways that the structure uh but hopefully we're kind of entering into a new part of this 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 pandemic i i i mean i don't you know i think the pandemic well this is not a (laughs) An amateur public health forum, but of course, ever, our whole lives have become an amateur public health forum. So I will say, yeah. that my suspicion is that it's just with us forever in ever mutating forms, and that yeah. we will both live with it and hopefully vaccinate ourselves against it and continue to, you know, you get your flu shot, you get your COVID shot, you go about your business. And I, I'm, 
hoping and expecting that it will be like that without too much further disruption. Although, what do I know? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I, I mean, I think you just mask up and, you know, yeah. I, I, will, I will tell you being on an airplane right now feels a little weird when, you know. I was on an to... airplane the day after the judge threw out the mask mandate and I was the only yeah. person on the plane with it. Not because I'm so great or anything. It's just, I used to get sick every time I flew. And, and then I realized, oh, I'm, I, you know, I flew a few times, I guess, with the masks on and I felt great afterwards. So I'm, whatever, I don't, a, a mask to me just keeps anyone from seeing like the green stuff in my teeth. I'm perfectly happy to have it and I will wear it on planes forever. No, no, I, 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 I do not see a time when I'm not wearing that thing on a plane. It's just, it's just what I'm used to. I think finally after two years, I figured out how it can't fog up my glasses. Right. I'm like, I'm not going away from that. Like it took me a while to figure that out, you know, right. so I'm, I'm good. Yeah. So. I, yeah. And I, and as far as writing during the pandemic went, I found, and this was very surprising to me that in my desperation to escape my family, I had to create a little room inside my own head and I started writing and I'd been yep. kind of it's, it was really strange. I've been blocked before, not blocked exactly, but I couldn't figure out what really, how or what to write about next. And then quarantine started and I was like, oh, if I'm going to be really with these people who I love, I love, they're my family, I love yeah. them, you know, but if I'm going to be with these people 24 hours a day, I'm going to have to create some space that they can't get into. Yeah. And that space was writing. It was so lucky that it turned out that way because I, I, it was that or lose my mind really. And so I just started writing with absolutely no idea what would happen or if it would be any good. And that was fine too. I just, I really, it was the first time since graduate school that I really just wrote for myself because I, I needed to not go crazy. I mean, I was teaching online and teaching my kids online and, you know, like, like, Cloroxing my groceries. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know when I wasn't. Yeah. yeah. No, it is. It's interesting. It's a really interesting thing, right? Which is like, how do you return back to that unconscious space? Yeah. It's really, really hard to do, right? It, and it is interesting that the pandemic actually, when I think that that's what you, what was so weird about it is so much of our lives are planned around futureness, right? In yeah. two months, I will do this. Right. In four months, I have this planned. And I think collectively, we were like, you know, there's, I don't know what moment occurred, right? You're like, oh, this is not, there's no quick fix on this one. This one, we, we're in for a bit. And I, so I think it, it your, your, my sense of temporality changed very significantly. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And, so, and so that you, you're right, that you can create different spaces once, your, your sense of your days are not based on what you're going to be doing next. There was, right, exactly. There was no editor waiting anymore. There was no people. It was just like, today is today, and I'm going to write today because I need to. And, and, and although I, like so many of us, right, I'm a very future-oriented person. I have all my calendars. You know, I have little dots on my calendar from now until 23. I found some pleasure in not having a calendar. And as well as it also made me incredibly anxious, you know? And yeah. um, uh, I've often said that I don't know how long I'll be able to write, but I am hope I get to read forever because reading was also a great, a great bomb during that time. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Yeah, and so now as we draw to a close, let me, uh, and I'm sure for everyone who's watching this reading is a great bomb for you. So let me, if you haven't read uh, Samir's book, I really can't it's it's not only is it um socially relevant it really is a page turner you you empathize with raj and want everything to work out and also bite your nails that it won't and so i can't recommend it enough it's a terrific book hey i thank you for the time and the great questions and um i i, I really appreciate it and it was uh you know it, it's uh you, you do most of this work on your own. And so it is really lovely to be in Isn't conversation it? and yes. and have and, and kind of laugh about random stuff and decide never to mention kind of 
came last never, weekend. Right? Never, so those are all never, such. Never, there's never. so much. There's so many actionable items that came out of this conversation. Yes. I really yes. appreciate yes. that. Yes. Keep that all, next to you at all times. Yes. Yeah. yes. Of all the important things we learned, we, <laughs> apparently there's a cutoff for when you can talk about Kanye. <laughs> Again, thank you, Samir and Lauren, and I hope everyone has a great day. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.